Good evening and welcome to 0800 TARDIS News. Now, we're going to be going off a little bit of our usual beaten topic of Doctor Who, and we're actually going to be interviewing some politicians, which is a bit different. But first, we've got lovely stuff. Now, this is when I wish I had auto cue and don't, as clue says, but you know, we're talking a brief bit about history of the internet and Doctor Who. 1963 saw many advances in technology. The Soviet Union put the first woman in space. Astronomers recognised the first quasar. And at Syncom, the first geosynchronised communication satellite is launched from Cape Canaveral using the Delta B launch vehicle. During this time, Joseph Licklider wrote the first historic memo about connecting computers and a joint committee of industry and government developed the first universal standard encoding language for computers leading to the birth of the internet. It also saw the launch of television's most enduring characters, Doctor Who. 50 years on, there are nearly 3,000 satellites orbiting the Earth. We live in a world where computers in our pockets outperform the Apollo system that made the giant leap to the moon. A world where the Hubble has looked so far into time, we are now questioning our very understanding of the physical, well, physics we call reality, is probably the better word of it. <laughs> we often forget about our little blue-green planet as home to over 7 billion people, many of whom want to be saved by the Doctor, but the Doctor is a character on a TV show. In the real world, it's up to us to make the decisions to understand what we can do right, we have the pleasure of being joined by two hard-working people dedicated to helping New Zealand make the most of opportunities we have in front of us. Our guests have a solid understanding of the problems facing New Zealand, and more importantly, they want to do something about it by getting elected to Parliament. Today on 0800 TARDIS News, we're joined by Lila Hari, the leader of the Internet Party, and Cullen Valentine, the candidate for Wellington Central. So, Lila, we'll tell a bit about yourself first. <laughs> what are you famous for? <laughs> well, first of all, I want to say this is awesome, mm. and it is this kind of show that makes the internet what it is. Mm. Um, the greatest thing we have, owned by us collectively as humanity, mm -hmm. that is is made up of all the content that's created by people like you, Sam. So I just yeah. think it's awesome um, that you're doing this in your living room. Yes. And it's the kind of innovation and opportunity to create content that all New Zealanders should have access to with good, high-quality, cheap internet services. Yes, and yourself, Colin? What, what's, <laughs> what are you all famous for? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, my expertise is in social media. Um, I kind of grew up with the internet and I think I'm very fortunate to be part of a generation who doesn't have to touch a line of code in order to interact with <laughs> computers in the way that I do. Um, I mean, I'm an arts graduate and I'm very thankful to be able to go to work every day and to create and to write in a way that instantly reaches people. Um, and that's a really important resource to me and I think I'm very lucky to live in a time when I can actually spend all day on Facebook. <laughs> God, I think all of us would like that as a job. <laughs> so, Lila, I'm sure all the fans would like to know, when did you last watch Doctor Who? Well, John Pertley was Doctor Who last time I watched it, I'm afraid. I've probably caught glimpses of later Doctors, um, but as a sort of serious mm. Doctor Who watcher, I'm afraid my days were pretty early. <laughs> well, now, were you in black and white or colour? <laughs> um, well, actually, I didn't even have TV till I was nine years old because I grew up in Fiji and there was no television there. Mm. Um, so we would come home for school holidays and kind of sneak things on black and white TV. Uh, I think colour TV, my grandparents must have got it. Um, and when did Colour TV oh, come to New Zealand? Yeah, so they probably got it light. soon after that. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I guess I saw most of my Doctor Who in colour once we moved <laughs> back to New Zealand. Okay, and Cullen, as we already know you're a fan of the show from what you've previously told me, what made Doctor Who appeal to you? Doctor Who to me, it, it's amazing that this is 
quite a low budget show by um, the standards particularly of you know um, things like HBO or you know it's made on a very modest budget but the um, the power of the stories mm -hmm. and the kind of episodic nature of it is really appealing to me it's very different than a lot of sci-fi like it's not hard sci-fi it's more of an almost soap opera kind of atmosphere but that creativity and the ability to weave a new story every week or to come back to kind of a quite a rich history in quite an irreverent way really appeals to me. Hmm. Oh, and um, Lila, while we're talking there, are there any locally produced shows you remember or perhaps inspired by you? That inspired you, I should say? <laughs> Uh, locally produced shows. Yeah, well, um, <laughs> try to push on the fact New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> I am. Um, I. I'm a. I'm a really big Outrageous Fortune fan. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, Outrageous Fortune got me watching television again because, um, as I say, I grew up without television till mm -hmm. I was nine years old. Um, I lived in a house where. The boys dominated the remote control, or actually we didn't have remote controls in those days, so I didn't get much say about what television programs were watched. Um, and and then, yeah, I just never really was a telly watcher. Um, I got recaptured by television with Outrageous Fortune because it was set in my local suburb, Te Aratu, in West oh, okay. Auckland. Um, the characters were very real to me, in fact... You know, some of the stuff we've seen go down in our local community would make Outrageous Fortune look mild in comparison. Um, so, yeah, it really spoke to me as a New Zealander and a Westie. Um, and, and that then triggered me into watching um, series in a binge-like fashion um, that I've missed over the last sort of few years of the, re the renaissance of television. Um, so yeah, I did, did Mad Men from start to finish in a few compulsive nights and weekends where it was just one more episode. I know that feeling yeah. perfectly well. <laughs> Doctor Who's just as addicting. Yeah. Might yeah. be the next one to be addicted it to. It sounds like it. I've got yeah. Borgen on my list at the moment and I've just started that. Yeah, Ultra Shameless after that as well. Okay, look, there, <laughs> I have a lifetime of television to catch up on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. the election. If you... <laughs> yeah, well, exactly, that's the first focus, yeah. Yeah. Now, Lila, what inspired you to become the leader of Internet Party? Um, two, two or three things, really. Mm. Um, first of all, the, the situation in this election year, I think it's a really serious one for mm. New Zealand. Um, we are at risk of New Zealanders re-electing a national government, which has done enormous damage to our country over the last six years and cost us a lot of opportunities in our development. But we're not at risk of re-electing that because too many people are going to vote national. The biggest risk we have is that too many people don't vote at all. And in the last election, a million voters who who were eligible to vote, didn't vote. That's the same number of people who voted for national. Um, so the first reason I suggested this job was because I knew that it was a new, exciting movement that had the chance to reconnect people to politics and to help get those voters out. Um, for me, the big policy issue uh, was fr is free tertiary education. Um, so the internet party with MANA are the only parties campaigning for free tertiary education and that was a deal maker for me. Um, I think free tertiary education should be a right of all young New Zealanders and I want to be part of reintroducing it um, to our New Zealand to our New Zealand laws and, and policies. Now here's on more serious questions. The BBC which produces Doctor Who and is also a public broadcaster has grown into a globally recognised source for entertainment but also for information. How best could New Zealand's technology to grow its information and entertainment resources? How, you know, how best could New Zealand do it? Um, I, I think there's a range of ways. Um, first of all, we're advocating for a, a thorough um, upgrade of our broadband infrastructure because um, to allow people like yourself to make and upload these shows at a speed that isn't, I'm sure, um, having you pounding on the table <laughs> or desk in frustration. Leaving it, uh, leaving it to upload overnight. 
Yeah, so there's a <laughs> there's a certain um, build it and they will come kind of mentality, and we want to encourage um, the creativity exhibited by New Zealanders kind of throughout our history. Um, and I think that the renaissance in do-it-yourself media is a huge part of that, and um, that these communities are able to assemble online is really important, and that we give people the infrastructure and the encouragement that they need to do that um, is really important. Yeah. Now, does the Internet Party have any ideas on how to address delayed broadcasting of international TV shows? Yes. Very big <laughs> issue over here. Doctor <laughs> Who's a classic example. 12 days. Yeah, our copyright <laughs> policy um, is very strong in this area, and we're looking to do everything that we can to encourage um, legal streaming services, um, because we, although we believe that piracy is a huge problem, um, we believe that problem is caused by exactly the um, factors you're talking about. The fact that these um, media products are not available for purchase in New Zealand. Uh, and it's a huge problem that we're going to tackle um, by making infringement only the case if you are able to legally purchase a show. So, I mean, this is really a case of the the content creating world um, being still using an, an old business model for sharing and distributing content um, and a business model that just can't work in, in the internet age. Um, what we see is incentives to pirate and what we would like to see is the broadening of access to legal content. Um, one specific policy we have is that the those of us who go around geoblocks um, in order to be able to view content legally, uh, well, legally if we lived in another country um, at the same time as other people, um, should not be at any risk of prosecution. That that should be um, made. It should be made very clear that if content is available offshore and if we're able to access it from New Zealand um, then we are not breaking the law by downloading it and paying for the content um, where it comes from. Okay. <laughs> and inside and outside the home the internet presence is expanding. How can public broadcasting better integrate technology? It's a bit of a lack of that at the moment. <laughs> I think we actually have to have um, what is sorely lacking in the current government, which is a vision for this sort of thing. And you have to take it right back um, to a starting point and say, what would a public broadcaster look like if it was iterated in the internet age? Mm. So if the BBC or if TVNZ were to come into existence now with the technology available, um, I don't believe it would be a broadcast network. I believe it would be a, a very interactive, um, social media driven uh, YouTube kind of channel where people can self-access um, educational resources, where people can um, interact with the shows directly and kind of uh, tailor their own media. Um, so I think we really have to have some vision when it comes to, to planning for a, a really essential resource, which is a public broadcaster. Okay. Now, talking about fibre optic broadband, in many rural New Zealand, many people rely on mobiles for their internet. This is especially true in the workplace, much of the work's done out in the field, so to speak, and the rural sector is under-resourced in mobile technology and penalised with the current pricing structure. And as I actually heard from earlier today from Kim.com, that he went to many of these places and no bars and cell phone coverage. Um, how can this be remedied to allow rural New Zealand greater collaboration into online services so essential to our future growth as a nation? Well, <clears throat> there are a couple of issues there. Um, first of all, in terms of fibre, uh, the, there is, I mean, obviously a plan for the rollout mm. of ultrafast broadband in you know the defined areas through the UFB initiative and through the rural broadband initiative. There are lots of issues with the way that's been done but those are on track 
um, and will eventually provide broadband um, services into the areas that are mapped for that. There is a big problem in between those two areas where you have fibre up to a particular limit um, and then nothing in between that limit and the rural broadband initiative. So that is a major issue for people living on the sort of outskirts um, of, of the metropolitan areas in the sort of periphery. Um, we would like to see community-based initiatives to extend fibre where fibre exists under the, the existing initiatives right right throughout um, the communities around those areas mm. so that 97.5% of New Zealanders could have access to fibre in their homes. A lot of that could be done now and done relatively cheaply um, by either extending fibre, for instance from a local school, um, or boosting it with wireless technology. Um, and, and we're keen for community-based solutions and to support communities to develop their own solutions to this. That will require us to have a big deregulation of control um, of the fibre service and the wireless services in that sort of space um, that isn't currently served. And we need, I mean, there will be issues around um, access to you know trenches, people being able to literally dig for themselves if necessary um, because the actual fibre is a relatively cheap part of the system. The problem is the resources that are needed to dig it into the ground um, or to, to carry it overhead on lines and we think those are solvable by communities um, with the government enabling communities um, to do it for themselves. The alternative is going to be guerrilla wireless, guerrilla broadband, because people are going to start <laughs> doing it for themselves. And frankly, you know, I wouldn't blame them. Well, we already have one company in the local area, Foxnet, basically really pushed it on Foxton and started from basically, yeah, as you say, guerrilla yeah, wireless, yeah. because, you know, that's how it started, which was, you know, Broadband speeds in Foxton Township were right, but the beach were shocking. Yeah. And he expanded from there. Now in Foxton it's great. A little bit out in the rural it's not as good, but it's there and it's there as an alternative. Yeah. I mean we've got a candidate in Northland, for instance, who has has been trying to develop a proposal for boosting the fibre from the school through wireless to the surrounding community in Kaitaia all doable for a very small amount of money. Um, in fact, the schools, them, the school itself, the school in question, although they've got fibre to the school, they don't still don't have an operating contract with an internet service provider because they don't get the support from the Ministry of Education to, to utilise the fibre. So, you know, it's this crazy situation where there is fibre up to the school, the school's not using it, and the community can't get access to it beyond the school, even though that could be done for a very small amount of money. It's amazing, that. Yeah. You know. uh, now, many important towns, such as Wairoa, Otaki and Hokitika, appear to be excluded from the ultra-fast broadband rollout. Would the Internet Party consider extending fibre to the door program to include more rural communities? Well, this is exactly the problem we're talking yeah. about, where you've got... Um, the ultra fast broadband rollout, which you know goes up to a certain point. Um, I might add, I live two kilometres from the centre of downtown Auckland, and we're getting it nowhere, no time soon either. We have eight megabit internet services, two yeah. kilometres from CBD Auckland. So you know this is a problem for a lot of people. But you know the issue you're you're addressing is exactly this problem where you have between the rollout, which is, you know, the metropolitan areas yes. primarily, and the rural broadband initiative, you have this gap of people who are not being going to be connected at yeah. all. And that's the gap we want to fill and fill fast um, with with initiatives that make sense for that particular location and that particular community. Not a one size fits all approach, um, but something that you know, is, is doable in that community. Yeah. 
Now, many subdivisions are not accommodating for ultra-fast broadband in their infrastructure development. With, Unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. Would the Internet Party support regulations that all subdivisions include fibre optic <clears throat> connectivity? Uh, I don't think we've specifically developed policy on that, um, but it's a great idea to put on our on our policy incubator. <laughs> so, you know, Internet Party members um, through our policy incubator Incubator, which is powered by Lumio, a great internet-based um, decision-making tool, can recommend new ideas like that. Um, and it sounds like one that I think would probably get a lot of support from members within the party. Now, the other one is Realme ID. Much of our lives are now spent adapting to the integration of technology. Managing our identity is perhaps the most crucial part of the that integration which we have to come to terms with. Realme is fast becoming unavoidable step of supply government services. With the massive disparity between urban and rural internet services, does the internet party feel rural New Zealanders um, can be confident that they are being adequately looked at during the unprecedented shift how government services are supplied? Mm. Um, yeah, I think it's a really important question. Um, it comes back to the fundamental infrastructure um, <laughs> that we've discussed, which is obviously a huge um, issue facing New Zealand right now. Um, but yeah, we need, we need to make sure that um, as these services transition to online more and more, um, that we do have parity um, and that we are looking forward to the future where all New Zealanders are using online services, but that we, we also aren't leaving people behind. Um, so that's, that's really important. And um, there are numerous concerns about privacy on that, especially when identity is involved. Are there any other areas of Realme ID system that you feel should be improved? Um, we're looking at a, a full-scale review um, of Realme with um, a view to kind of consulting experts on exactly how it can be improved, um, especially uh, with regards to the API, making sure that it's really easy for people to implement for their businesses, um, and making sure that this sort of public asset that we're developing as a nation uh, can help people to um, identify customers and that people can be assured of security. Um, with their very valuable identities. Now, moving on to tertiary education, because that's another part that affects my generation, because we're all young. Um, what is the biggest hurdle in tertiary education for rural New Zealand? Lala, since I've... Well, I think there's a bunch of hurdles, but, I mean, obviously for people who have to um, go away from their hometown to study in a university or polytech, um, there is a massive cost involved in that. Not only are they being charged student fees, but they have to pay their living expenses and they have to borrow to pay for their living <laughs> expenses. Um, so for kids who are travelling away from home um, to attend universities, um, and for kids who want, for whatever reason, to leave home in their hometown, <laughs> there should be a universal student allowance to um, reduce the cost of education and to stop the student loan um, blowout that we've got. Um, we also propose no fees. So our policy is a fully free tertiary education policy. No fees and a universal student allowance, um, which would make a really big difference to the, the, um, the the access to education for people who need to, to leave home. Mm. Um, we also want to see a lot more use of online, um, the online education opportunities. Um, we know that there is, you know, there are already lots of um, non-assessed courses that you can do online. So we've got, you know, lots of um, online learning. Mm. But, and lots of that's free and lots of it's great, but it doesn't earn you, assess, you know, it's not assessed and you don't get credits for it. Um, so we need to see improvements in access to credited, accredited online learning 
um, so that people don't necessarily need to leave home or leave home as often in order to participate in tertiary education. And are there any aspects of study link you feel need improvement? Um, well, I don't like study link full stop, and we would get rid of study link if we had universal student allowances because the whole study link thing is built on, you know, the maintaining a student loan system. Yes. And we want to scrap the loan system and fully fund tertiary education, including living allowances. Imagine the savings that you could make in administrative time and cost um, with a free education system and the nightmare that students go through. We also, as part of our full employment policy, want to guarantee students summer jobs. Um, that's a big factor in student living you know, living standards is, is the difficulty that students have in getting secure work over the summer holidays. Um, and so that will be an aspect of our support system for students. Yeah, and then as a question in general to top off the interview, <laughs> what is the one thing the Internet Party would like to achieve for rural New Zealand? Cheap universal internet. Yeah, um, it's, it was really inspiring. Uh, I was reading up on the broadband for the Rural North program, which is um, a lot of the inspiration for our kind of model of how to get fibre everywhere. Um, and just to see farmers out digging ditches to, to lay fibre, um, it, it was a really amazing video to watch. It was a little piece that the BBC did. And the anchors were kind of just almost really surprised that this was happening and that you could actually just lay cable for yourself. Um, so that it was a really inspiring thing to see and, and something the Internet Party wants to support completely. We want to get out of the way of communities um, and, and sort of let them come together and acknowledge that the Internet is a community project, but we can also have old-fashioned community projects around that Internet. Yes. I'm sure we'd have Doctor Who digging <laughs> creatures if he got the chance. Come or on. if she got the chance. Oh, you have to sit there and do it. <laughs> Can I have more changing sex? I don't know. Well, actually, it has been suggested with the more way too conservative, you <laughs> Whovians. Yeah, well, I mean, there was the 50th anniversary. There was suggested that when the War Doctor was born, that could have been the way that could have happened. Because the regeneration was a lot different to the rest of the regenerations. It was regenerated and it was by, um, what's it called, like a, a, a potion or something that did it. Something completely different. So that might be the only chance for, for it to happen properly. Well, I think with Russell T Davis um, laying the foundation of the new series, um, he's definitely very LGBTIQ friendly. Um, so I think a transgender doctor is definitely not oh, out of the question. Actually, I do remember the episode where, um, what's it called, David Tennant played, uh, was it Cassandra got into David Tennant and he pulled it off so good! There you go. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I mean that has happened. <laughs> yeah. Well I'd like to thank you both for coming down to my house for this. Thank you for having us. Yes, yes. thank you very Pleasure. much for having us. Oh yes, yes. And any messages you'd like to give out to the fans? Well, I think that the um, this election is a bit like the TARDIS. It kind of looks small <laughs> from the outside, but when we get in there and actually use our votes, it is enormous and the possibilities are endless. And so the most important message for Whovians everywhere is enrol and vote. We can change the government, but we need your help to do it. If you'll vote for us, we'll tell you the doctor's real name. <laughs> <laughs> now that's treating. <laughs> can, you, can you uphold that policy? <laughs> you were, that's the bombshell. <laughs> <laughs> September 15th. September 15th. September 15th. Oh, okay. Well, that would be an exciting day. So, thank you for joining us on the show today. And it's great to have um, Lala Hari and, uh, was it, Cullen Valentine in it. the studio. And also to the uh, two tag alongs that are sitting behind her. <laughs> <laughs> Who have been so quiet. Yeah.
And uh, if you want to be part of the show or got any suggestions, feel free to contact me. My email address is sam at i800tartus.co.nz. Very simple and easy to remember. Or you can also message us on Facebook. And now you can even follow me on Twitter if you haven't done that yet. <laughs> Amazing how many people I have little random ones that start following me. But yeah. So from us, we'd like to thank you for watching. And you can see us either online, on the show, or in person. Thank you and good night.